All right, so um, we can characterize our ecosystem by how chemicals like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen cycle through and how energy, so sunlight energy, which um, comes into the environment and is converted to chemical energy in plants, which then is converted to chemical energy in animals, um, flows. So chemicals don't leave the environment. They just move from one environmental area, like the air, and then they go into a living organism, like a plant, and then they might go into another organism, like an animal. And when the plant or animal dies, the chemicals will then move into the ground, the dirt, and eventually bacteria can take the, the um, chemical, like um, nitrogen, and convert it back to a form of nitrogen that can move into the air. And so it's constantly cycling. These cycle all the time. Whereas energy comes from the sun. The sun is the ultimate form of energy. And it's going to flow to the earth and be converted into other forms of energy. And every time it's converted, we lose some energy. So energy flows and then it dissipates. And so here you can see... Um, and plants taking in sunlight energy, converting it to chemical energy. Chemicals then move into the um, different organisms. So here we have a rabbit or a mouse that are taking in the chemicals from the plant. They're not gaining as much energy. Every time we change energy, we lose energy as heat. So we get all this heat that enters the environment. And then we have other animals that eat animals. So like here's a snake that might eat that mouse. Um, and it's also going to gain some of the energy, but not as much. So it's going to lose energy as heat as well. And here we have a bird that's going to pick up, I don't know, the mouse or the snake or whatever it wants to. And it also will gain energy from that animal, but it will lose some energy as heat. Um, and then as things die, waste, um, organic waste, is going to be broken down by fungi and bacteria in the environment, also um, insects. And um, the, the chemicals are going to move into the earth. And then eventually those chemicals can be brought back to... Um, the air, or they can seep into the water, and other organisms can use them chem those chemicals. So biodiversity, oh, hello. It encompasses all of the species on Earth and all of our genes. And so a large, diverse population is going to be better able to survive environmental conditions. Um, so there are billions, or no, billions, yeah, billions of organisms on Earth, and there are probably, um, you know, many millions of different species that we already know about, um, and others that we're learning about all the time. But some species that we've learned about are already extinct. Um, that's where this picture comes in. You know, these are dodos. We're the last dodos on the planet. So I put all our eggs safely in this one basket. Um, kind of a joke. Um, dodo birds are extinct. All right, the last thing I want to talk about in this chapter is the process of science. So we know that biology is the study of life, which means we are constantly studying living things. Um, we always have questions. Biologists are kind of um, the ultimate child. Remember, um, you, I'm sure you remember asking your parents questions, or if you have children, your kids have asked you questions. Why is the sky blue? Why is the water wet? Why can't we breathe water? Um, what makes the ground um, cold in the wintertime? What makes rain? 
Um, why are clouds puffy? You know, I just any question. And what biologists do is we take those questions and we actually try to figure out the answers. You know, why is? Um, that's what all scientists do. Biologists study living things, though. So I say um, all scientists, you know, uh, likely uh, biologist isn't going to study the um, water cycle unless they're looking at the water cycle associated with living things. Um, does that make sense? And I hope it does. Um, we typically look at living things, okay? And so we use this method called the scientific method, uh, which allows us to come up with you know, we, we use observations, come up with some type of a hypothesis that we then can use or run tests on um, to experiment and see if our hypothesis was correct or not. And so we first observe things. This is just the basic scientific method. We observe um, and we decide, you know, okay, I, um, in my research, I studied cockroaches and the pinworms inside of them. My thought was what causes, you know, what I noticed when I initially observed was that um, almost all of the cockroaches that I dissected had pinworms. And so I thought, I wonder why some of them have a lot of pinworms while others had very few pinworms. And, you know, I was just wondering because the idea was, hey, pinworms are parasites parasitic organisms. And so if we have these pinworms that are inside of cockroaches, maybe we can use them as biological weapons against them and we can kill off cockroaches naturally. That was, you know, kind of a thought in my head. Um, it wasn't what I initially started out doing, but it's what I did. Um, my initial thought was to study cockroach immune systems, but that didn't work out. Um, so once I came up with that, when I, once I observed that cockroaches had pinworms, I then came up with my hypothesis. And from there, I ran experiments, observed more, I collected the data points, I then analyzed my data, and I came to some conclusions. Um, oftentimes, if the conclusions support the hypothesis multiple times, you make a theory out of it. And I do have, I love this song. It's a wonderful song, so I'm going to play it for you. Um, very catchy, very good um, tune. Yeah. This is for all my family
Love that song. So beautiful. All right. So when we're doing science, we have to come up with these questions. And we use a process called inductive reasoning to come up with questions, good questions. So, I mean, you can come up with questions, but if you aren't able to test the question, run a test, then it's not probably a good question. You know, if I say um, the life on Mars... If there's life on Mars, then my dog will have um, puppies. Um, I can't test that because I can't go to Mars and look for life right now. Does that make sense? Um, or, you know, no, not or. And that's a better way. And so instead, we look at observations that we have, you know, we observe something that we're interested in. And we come up with questions from those from what we have observed, from what we know already, and from what we see, and maybe from research that we've done, we come up with a good question. And then we use deductive reasoning to help us to run the, the experiments. And this uses if-then logic. So if this, then that. So here's what I did. Um, I used inductive reasoning. Um, once I observed that these are Australian cockroaches, that my Australian cockroaches had pinworms. I then decided to look at different, different um, things that might influence their infections. So maybe, you know, what I observed was that females tended to have more worms. I also noticed that um, larger cockroaches had more worms. So sex influences pinworm infection levels in cockroaches. That could be true. It might not. I don't know. Age influences pinworm infection levels in cockroaches, in Australian cockroaches. So the size of the cockroach influences it. And again, this may be true. It may not. I don't know. But these were my hypotheses. So then I used if-then reasoning to come up with a way to test this. So if sex influences pinworm infection levels in Australian cockroaches, then males and females will have significantly different levels of pinworms, which I can test. I can dissect male and female cockroaches and count the number of worms inside. If size or age did this, influence pinworm infection levels, then I could look at larger and smaller cockroaches and see if there was a significantly different number of pinworms. And what I found was that size or age, not sex, mattered. Cockroaches of the same size, independent of their sex, had the same amount of pinworms. And this is one of the pinworms. This is called Ladyanema appendiculatum, um, the most common worm that I had in my cockroaches. So once we have these, um, have went through the scientific method and came to a conclusion, if we have multiple conclusions that support the same hypothesis, it can become a theory. And so here are examples of theories, cell theory, homeostasis theory, gene theory, ecosystem theory, and evolution. I'm going to stop here because it's going to end. So have a wonderful day and I'll see you on